Now, Mother, right through yeah. history, all the great saints had great doubts about their faith. Have you ever had that doubt? What intrigues the public imagination is that a personage so tiny should dominate the world. I am living life because of Mother Teresa. It seems extraordinary what we have to report now on this day, the day before the world mourns Princess Diana on the day of her funeral, but we have just learned that Mother Teresa has died. Speak of compassion and selflessness, and the name of Mother Teresa instantly comes to mind. Mother Teresa was busy, as usual, saving the world, and I mean that quite literally. Mother Teresa is the founder of a society called the Missionaries of Charity. But was she really as perfect and faultless as everybody thought her to be? Hailed as St. Teresa of Calcutta within the Catholic Church, her entire life's purpose was dedicated to tending to the sick and impoverished. She was a charlatan, pure and simple. And she was known for her divine spirituality up until September 5, 1997, which was the day she died. Mother Teresa's spirituality was very connected with Jesus on the cross. And he gave it in pain and he gave it in suffering. Her entire life she was never known to be keeping secrets. But several things about her were only revealed after she had died. And it left the world in utter shock. No one knew about her feeling of isolation. The letter she wrote documented the loneliness she endured over a period of six decades. An inner turmoil. The day was December 11, 1979, as the world bore witness to a one-of-a-kind scene in Oslo. Mother Teresa, wearing her blue-bordered sari that everybody had become familiar with, stood resiliently as she received the Nobel Peace Prize. I now call upon Mother Teresa to receive the diploma and the gold medal. This was the world's way of thanking her for her unwavering dedication to the destitute and the needy. In her acceptance speech, she talked about her life's mission and focused on the need to love one's neighbor as oneself, all while invoking the image of Christ's self-sacrifice on the cross. Right there at that moment, she preached compassion and shed light on societal ills such as abortion and drug addiction, while celebrating the arrival of Christmas as a beacon of hope and joy. All of these were things that people had heard her talk about her entire life, but if they thought that they knew the whole truth about Mother Teresa, they were wrong. Not a single person knew that beneath this facade of serenity was a massive spiritual turmoil that Mother Teresa had been feeling. In a private letter to Reverend Michael van der Peet, which came to light very recently, Mother Teresa confessed about her inner torment. But what was she feeling confused about? In the letter, Mother Teresa unveiled a stark dichotomy in her perception of Christ, which was hanging between her outward expressions of unwavering faith, all while she was feeling absolute spiritual desolation on the inside. She said that Christ has a special love for others, but he had left her in silence to deal with this emptiness that wouldn't go away. It was clear that Mother Teresa was going through visceral existential turmoil, and merely 11 weeks after this letter was sent, Mother Teresa was up on the stage wearing her happy mask while giving her acceptance speech. This stark contrast between her public appearance and private anguish was solid proof of her self-contradiction. Mother Teresa was one of the most revered figures of the 20th century, and after this intimate letter was finally revealed, the world started questioning the perception that Mother Teresa had had this entire time. While she exuded an aura of serene devotion on the outside, captured in silent prayers witnessed by associates and television cameras alike, her private correspondence revealed a hidden reality of spiritual dryness, where the divine presence had seemingly vanished. But it wasn't just one letter. Soon, the whole truth emerged in front of the world. But to see the full picture, you have to delve into Mother Teresa's life right from the beginning, her death. On September 5, 1997, the world was shaken by the news of Mother Teresa's passing after she took her last breath within the confines of her Missionaries of Charity headquarters in Calcutta. This happened after she had gone through several years of deteriorating health, 
which included lung, heart, and kidney problems. In the end, Mother Teresa died due to a cardiac arrest. Known affectionately as the Saint of the Gutters, she was surrounded by her sisters in her final moments while all of them wore the white and blue saris of her order. As recounted by her close confidant, Sunita Kumar, Mother Teresa uttered the words, I can't breathe, before she passed away. We have just learned that Mother Teresa has died. Sister Nirmala, her successor at the helm of the Missionaries of Charity, announced the news to the world, stating that their beloved founder had suddenly gone to Jesus. The profound impact of her passing reverberated across nations, drawing tributes from dignitaries such as Pope John Paul II and President Clinton, who hailed her as a beacon of love and compassion. Despite the accolades showered upon her, it was in the streets of Calcutta, her spiritual home, where Mother Teresa's legacy truly flourished, embodying a selfless devotion that went beyond ordinary religious divides in a nation predominantly Hindu. If Diana was the queen of hearts, Mother Teresa was the queen of the poor and the queen of humanity. As India slumbered, unaware of the loss it had incurred, the news of her demise awakened a profound sense of grief and reverence among those who revered her as a symbol of unwavering kindness. But during her life, while Mother Teresa was out in the world, helping whoever she could, and always having a positive outlook on everything, there was a parallel battle that she was fighting with her own self. Not a single soul knew about what she was going through. And the truth only emerged after she had passed away, an exorcism. On the fourth anniversary of Mother Teresa's death, a startling revelation emerged as Archbishop Henry de Souza disclosed that a few months before her demise, she had been through an exorcism. This was done because they had suspected that she was under some sort of demonic oppression. The incident had happened in November 1996 during her hospitalization at the Birla Hospital in Calcutta, where she endured two restless nights prompting Archbishop D'Souza to intervene. She had been hospitalized for angioplasty and had full awareness of the exorcism that was about to take place. Once she had given her consent, the Archbishop sought help, summoning Father Rosario Strosio, who conducted a 30-minute exorcism prayer over the troubled nun. Father Strosio corroborated the Archbishop's account, noting Mother Teresa's uncharacteristic behavior before the exorcism and emphasizing the prevalence of such spiritual interventions in Catholicism, underscoring the enduring spiritual battles faced by saints throughout history. Astonishingly, the effects were immediate, with Mother Teresa experiencing a newfound tranquility and restfulness following the ritual. Archbishop de Souza attributed her susceptibility to such spiritual attacks to her profound holiness, suggesting that even saints like her could fall prey to malevolent forces. But could there be another reason for this exorcism that was performed on Mother Teresa? Let's get to the other side of the story. A compilation. A book titled Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light was published in 2003, which was essentially a compilation of her intimate correspondences. But here's the thing. These correspondences spanned over a period of six decades, and all of them exposed one hidden truth. For nearly 50 years, Mother Teresa had been struggling with a deep spiritual desolation, a void that remained despite her tireless acts of charity. Interestingly, these letters were preserved against Mother Teresa's will. She had wanted all of these letters to be destroyed and never read by the world, but this was overruled by the church. On the outside, Mother Teresa was a cheerful woman, and nobody could tell that something was wrong with her. But on the inside, she had a deep sense of spiritual agony, and in her letters, she had likened her inner turmoil to hell itself. In over 40 letters, she talked about how much she resented her spiritual dryness and even ended up questioning the very existence of God, all while she grappled with the gap that was forming between her public facade and inner anguish. But how exactly did this compilation come into being? The revelations within Come Be My Light came out not from the probing of a skeptical investigator, but from the hands of Reverend Brian Kolodichuk, a senior member of the Missionaries of Charity and Mother Teresa's own postulator, who was charged with advocating for her path to sainthood. All of these letters, when put together, tell Mother Teresa's story through a lens that has never been seen before. How it all began. On September 10th, 
1946, Mother Teresa had already dedicated 17 years of her life to teaching in Calcutta with the Loretto sisters, and this was the point where she began her transformative journey. She was exhausted and ill, so she went on a 400-mile train voyage to Darjeeling for her annual retreat in the Himalayan foothills. It was during this journey that she claimed to have experienced a divine encounter. The exact prayer dialogue was recounted to Archbishop Ferdinand Perrier in January 1947. And in that, Jesus implored Mother Teresa with urgency, questioning her resolve and challenging her to embrace her calling with devotion. He talked of his desire for Indian nuns and missionaries of charity to embody his love in the middle of the impoverished and marginalized. Jesus confronted Teresa with her perceived inadequacies, emphasizing her weakness and sinfulness as qualities destined for divine purpose. In response, Teresa humbly surrendered herself to Jesus, acknowledging her own limitations and placing her trust entirely in his will. Despite her doubts and insecurities, she expressed a willingness to be used as a vessel for God's glory, even if it meant stepping into unfamiliar and challenging roles. In essence, Christ had just asked her to give up teaching and instead immerse herself in the dire conditions of the slums of Calcutta, where the poorest of the poor were suffering left and right. With absolute conviction, she took this calling very seriously and envisioned a mission that went beyond mere humanitarian aid to encompass a spiritual awakening among the destitute. Despite initial skepticism from local authorities, including Archbishop Ferdinand Perrier, Mother Teresa's relentless determination and unwavering faith in her divine mission made her persist. Employing a blend of strategic persuasion and spiritual fervor, she navigated bureaucratic hurdles and sought approval for her radical mission. Through prayers and dialogues with Christ, she sought validation for her calling. Throughout this entire time, she was experiencing mystical visions that affirmed her chosen path, all of which helped her to keep going. Mother Teresa's spiritual journey included the experience of visions, and she even had an encounter with Christ on the cross. This was recounted by her confessor, Father Celeste Van Exem, who attested to the authenticity of her mystical experiences. Reflecting on her profound union with Jesus, Father Van Exem remarked on the intensity of her connection, suggesting that her communion with the divine transcended mere earthly bounds. Teresa herself later expressed the depth of this encounter in simple yet profound words, acknowledging the gift of Jesus' presence in her life. Finally, on January 6, 1948, after consultation with the Vatican, Perrier granted Mother Teresa the long-awaited permission to begin her sacred mission. Yet, even as she embarked on this newfound calling, she was struggling with the recurring absence of Christ, an emptiness that persisted despite her unwavering devotion, her unstable journey. How many of them are? Here in this area, we have got about 400. But this is called Dapa. In the beginning few months of 1948, Teresa went through a rudimentary medical course before she officially began her solitary mission onto the streets of Calcutta. Despite the challenges, she felt a sense of inner peace and fulfillment that could not be compared to anything else. She felt that she was exactly where she needed to be. A normal day on duty for Mother Teresa looked something like this. She would encounter destitute individuals who were on the brink of death and provide what little aid she could muster while surrounded by the grim realities of urban poverty. In a recount of her very first day on the job, Mother Teresa shared the tale of her encounter with an old man, abandoned and ailing on the streets, to whom she offered solace in the form of carbersone and water, earning his unexpected gratitude. Venturing into the Taltala Bazaar, she encountered a destitute woman on the brink of starvation and suffering from TB. Um, the government of India has received the people with great dignity and with great love for the people. Mother Teresa administered whatever aid she could in the hopes of alleviating her suffering though the outcome remained uncertain. Are you despairing yourself of being able to... Oh, no, not at all, not at all. Great things will come out of this. Just two months later, amidst the triumph of securing headquarters for her burgeoning mission, signs of distress emerged in her correspondence with Perrier. Despite outward success, Teresa felt lonely and struggled with an insurmountable sense of darkness that pervaded her being. Seeking solace and guidance, she turned to Perrier 
beseeching him for prayers to ward off feelings of desolation and doubt that plagued her spirit. Perrier's reassurances fell short in the face of Teresa's internal turmoil, as she struggled to reconcile her unwavering devotion with the absence of tangible signs of divine presence. Her inability to articulate her innermost struggles compounded her anguish, leaving her isolated in her suffering. Desperate for respite from the relentless onslaught of doubt and despair, Teresa asked Perrier for prayers to sustain her faltering faith and to maintain her facade of unwavering devotion in the face of profound spiritual desolation. While she was in the depths of her spiritual turmoil, she got counsel from a confessor and wrote down a heartfelt plea delving into the darkest implications of her theological crisis. This letter, which opens this chapter of her journey, along with another from 1959 questioning the very essence of faith, paints a clear picture of her unstable belief in God's existence. In this plea, she talked about wrestling with feelings of abandonment and despair. She struggled with the sense of isolation and emptiness that had enveloped her soul. In her desperate plea to God, she questioned the very foundations of her faith, confronting the agonizing silence and darkness that pervaded her existence. That kindness, that thoughtfulness to them, and shared with them the terrible pain, the terrible feeling of terrible loneliness. Torn between her longing for divine connection and the crushing weight of doubt, Teresa laid bare her inner turmoil because there was a seeming absence of God's presence in her life. Faced with the relentless onslaught of doubt and uncertainty, she dared to voice her innermost fears and uncertainties, trembling at the thought of blasphemy, yet unable to suppress the relentless questions that haunted her soul. Because she was the first one to carry Jesus as the handmaid of the Lord. The moment Jesus came in her life... She wanted to be forgiven, and to be close to Jesus, hoping that this plea would help make things better. I believe what you say, Father, and that family that prays together stays together. And if they stay together, naturally, they will love one another. But the more her mission flourished, the deeper her spiritual desolation became. In a letter to Perrier in March 1953, she bared her soul and talked about how much she hated the darkness that had surrounded her whole being ever since she had begun her work. Perrier sent her a reassuring response in return, but it failed to do anything to her escalating despair as she struggled with the absence of divine presence despite her tireless devotion. Teresa's struggle to reconcile her longing for God with the perceived rejection she experienced remained a closely guarded secret from the rest of the world but it soon manifested itself in a sense of alienation and spiritual emptiness. Her desperate pleas for peace and guidance can be seen through her correspondences, but all they did was reveal a soul tormented by doubt and yearning for a connection that seemed forever elusive. Despite her burgeoning missionaries of charity attracting global attention, Teresa's inner struggles remained, evolving through a succession of confessors, which is similar to patients transitioning between psychoanalysts, from Van Exem to Perrier, and later to Cardinal Lawrence Pakashi, followed by Reverend Joseph Neuner, her mentors with their own eyes, saw her descent into what she cryptically referred to as her darkness, portraying Jesus as the absent one. During her anguish, a glimmer of hope emerged with the passing of Pope Pius XII in 1958, when requiem masses reverberated worldwide. Seeking validation from the departed pontiff for her work, Teresa felt a fleeting reprieve, basking in the light that momentarily gave her rest from her decade-long torment. But this respite proved to be temporary because the darkness swiftly took over her once again, and once it was back, it persisted, her eventual acceptance. In an exchange that she had with Neuner around 1961, Mother Teresa thanked him for his guidance. From Albania. Albania. <laughs> Thank you. Acknowledging a newfound acceptance of the darkness she had long endured. Contrary to conventional responses to trauma, Teresa had now embraced her suffering, viewing it as a small reflection of Christ's own agony on earth. Neuner's wise counsel was rooted in three different things. First, he told Mother Teresa that there was no human cure for what she was going through. 
Secondly, he made her understand that feeling Jesus wasn't the only way one could tell that he was there. Because she was the first one to carry Jesus as the handmaid of the Lord. The moment Jesus came in her life, immediately she went in haste. And lastly, he told her that the very fact that she craved his presence means that he's already present in his life, even if he's hidden from her. This liberated Teresa from the shackles of her despair, affirming that her yearning for God had a reason. This revelation provided Teresa with a sense of purpose, transforming her anguish into a testament of faith and fortitude. Despite moments of lingering torment, she found solace in the notion that her spiritual struggle mirrored Christ's own ordeal on the cross, imbuing her suffering with profound significance. Grateful for Neuner's instrumental role in her spiritual journey, Teresa expressed a newfound affection for the darkness that had long consumed her soul. Though her anguish persisted, she resolved to embrace God's will, even in the absence of tangible solace. Over time, Teresa's acceptance of her spiritual desolation evolved into a cornerstone of her identity, guiding her steadfast commitment to serving the marginalized. Her reflection on the enduring nature of her suffering, extending even into the afterlife, became a sign of her unwavering dedication to alleviating the darkness of human suffering. Despite theological complexities, Teresa's willingness to endure eternal torment for the sake of others resonated deeply, encapsulating the boundless compassion that defined her legacy. I now call upon Mother Teresa to receive the diploma and the gold medal. Even five years after receiving the Nobel Prize, for this beautiful occasion where we can all together proclaim the joy of spreading peace. A Jesuit priest recalled her enduring struggle, emphasizing that her agonizing spiritual night had not been a passing phase, but a situation that was there to last. References to her spiritual dryness in a letter from 1995 foreshadowed her eventual death in 1997. Interpretations. This compilation of letters, meticulously gathered as part of her canonization process, was meant to talk about a very private struggle that was hidden beneath the surface of her saintly facade. It's important to understand that this book wasn't compiled to chastise or criticize Mother Teresa. The church fully acknowledges the phenomenon of spiritual desolation as they compare it to the dark night of the soul. This exact phenomenon was felt by mystics like St. John of the Cross, and Mother Teresa's situation was an example of how one's faith can be tested to its limits. The thing to gain from this is that despite enduring decades of spiritual aridity, she remained steadfast in her belief and unwavering in her mission to serve the destitute. In fact, Reverend Kolodichuk sees her dedication in the face of such inner turmoil as her most remarkable feat of spiritual heroism. In the story of Teresa's spiritual journey, a perplexing question emerges. Why did her communion with Jesus, once so vivid and sustaining, abruptly vanish as soon as the inception of the missionaries became real? Curiously, both secular and religious interpretations initially run on parallel tracks. They acknowledge the centrality of Catholic spirituality's identification with Christ's enduring suffering on the cross which is seen as essential for redemption. Teresa herself emphasized this connection, asserting that physical destitution fostered empathy with the poor and deepened her bond with Christ's agonizing sacrifice. Yet, as she set out on her mission, her spiritual wellspring seemed to dry up unexpectedly, leaving her parched and bewildered. Kolodichuk suggests a divine purpose in this desertion, giving credit to Teresa's need for purification against pride which would be proof of her indomitable spirit. Despite her triumphs, evidenced by her overcoming institutional hurdles and fulfilling Jesus' call, Teresa's internal landscape remained fraught with conflict. Dr. Richard Gottlieb, delving into the psychological intricacies, speculated on the self-imposed nature of her abandonment, a consequence of her relentless pursuit of humility and her fear of claiming credit for her accomplishments. He compared her plight to that of an executive committing a social gaffe in the middle of a career milestone. For Teresa, each win seemed to take a toll of misery, 
a paradoxical burden she bore in her quest for divine approval. Moreover, Gottlieb suggests that Teresa's assumption of an active role in her ministry might have unsettled her, prompting a retreat into the familiar role of the faithful yet forsaken lover. On the atheist front, Hitchens offers a stark explanation, positing that Teresa experienced a moment of awakening in 1948, a lot like the disillusionment among die-hard communists. This view, however, is met with resistance from religious circles, who reject attributing Teresa's suffering to self-imposed misery. Martin, presenting an alternative perspective, portrays Teresa as a steadfast spouse, unwavering in her devotion despite the apparent silence of her beloved. In this analogy, Teresa's dedication to her mission, akin to caring for a comatose partner, is an act of profound love and faithfulness. But whatever analogy you may believe in, Mother Teresa's letters paint a picture of complete spiritual agony, all of which was finally revealed to the world after she had died. Why do you think Mother Teresa felt this way? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.